Hey, welcome to Genre Exposure, a film podcast. Join us as we explore the wide world of cinema, broadening our horizons one movie at a time. I'm one of your hosts, Dustin, and as usual, I'm here with Michael. Hey, guys. And Jason. Hey, everybody. What's up, guys? How you doing? <laughs> I like your pause there. <laughs> And how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm happy to be here recording this one. Good. Yeah, doing Good. well, thank yeah. you. How about yourself? Good. Uh, we're done with October. Yeah, always sad to see Halloween go. It's almost a, it's it's sad, but a relief at the same time. I always feel a lot of pressure during October, like sure. as a horror fan. Like you have to do this. Get it all in. Yeah. yeah. Like it's not that I don't want to. And it's not that we don't watch horror movies all the time anyways. But... Yeah. <laughs> right. You can only watch them in October. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to, but then I feel like everybody's like, oh, well, you're a big horror fan. What did you watch in October? And I'm like, well, I just watched the shit that I always watch. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about Halloween, though, is that like during the month of October, you can get people who don't normally watch horror movies to watch them with you. Because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, it's Halloween. We have to watch a horror movie. It's for the occasion. Right. Mm-hmm. That's true. But then when you're to the... I was just going to sound snobby, but when you kind of get to the point where we're at in film, they're like, well, this wasn't scary. This was just weird. You mean beyond like, mortal kin? <laughs> no, there's just only so many times I want to watch the same like Halloween-themed movie year after year after year. So I start to want to... Like, sure. This is the first year I didn't watch Trick or Treat. I didn't watch it either. And I felt bad about it, hmm. but at the same time, I was just like, man, I've watched this so many and years in a row. that's trick or treat, not trick <laughs> or treat, because we definitely watched trick or treat. <laughs> we did. At least and it I was watched, a treat. At least I watched a trick or treat. Right. I can tell you this, I won't watch it next year. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy Kerr gonna get you. Yep. Uh, listen, we have some admin to take care of before we get into this episode. Okay. In our trivia episode, <laughs> yeah, we had this debate come up. About uh, spirit boards and what they're actually called when it's the nice published official name. It's not really a debate. Yeah, it's Ouija. So, one of our listeners very kindly commented in in support of Jason. Yes. However, Michael, what have you uncovered in your research? So, I will happily post this in the show's notes. Okay, I'll link to it. Um, But apparently there are two correct pronunciations of that... Ouija. Of that (laughs) word. And that... Um, in the UK, it is pronounced Ouija. However, in the US, and this is from the Cambridge Oxford Dictionary, in the US, it is pronounced Ouija. I stand on the fact that we <laughs> didn't go through two fucking wars with that country to say the same shit they do. If it's the Cambridge Oxford Dictionary, you think they would agree with the UK. <laughs> I think they genuinely know the UK is wrong. <laughs> what they, they they invented the language. Now, so our, you know, I got to give it to England. Now, our good friend Adam was in for Halloween. Who's friend of the show? Friend of the show. I'm still we, conjuring to try to get him on. We mm-hmm. talk about him all the time. Adam's one of the smartest people that I know in in real life. Maintains that Ouija. Is pronounced Ouija because it is the French and German, I guess, words right? for yes, yes, words for yes and no. We and ya. Mm-hmm. So that's what Adam maintains. Maybe it should be we ya. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I'm a proud American. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I can't. I can't even say that without just wanting to vomit. Um, I think the moral of the story is it doesn't matter in the end. Yeah, I think it's fine. Mm-hmm. You won trivia twice, you fuck. <laughs> just put your smug grant up your own ass and just shut up and say Ouija. I, I will say that we played it two more times, and once we got Jason drunk enough, I finally won. He did. He did. <laughs> yeah. Well, he actually just cycled the cards so many times that we got the same questions yeah. over and over. The same but isn't questions. that a weird phenomenon? Because if there's six questions a card, yes. to repeat so many questions so many times back to back. It was very strange. Maybe it's a miracle. A little Halloween miracle for old Dustin yeah. over here. I mean, I didn't win. There's no... <laughs> I was not winning at all. Yeah. But I do have to lump in one more complaint with oh, our God. Dr. Herbert West thing. Yes. I had a question about Happy Death Day. Sure. It was, uh, which, oh. which character's birthday does the story take place on? And I said, oh, the main character, Tree. Mm-hmm. And I got told it was wrong because the card just spelled out her whole name. Yeah, Tree was nowhere on the card. <laughs> Even though the whole film, all they do is call her Tree. Well, you know, had I not seen the movie, 
and know that they called her tree, I would have just had to take your word for it. I'm like, it says Teresa here, dude. So, mm. sorry. I don't know what these Trivial Pursuit people are thinking. <laughs> I mean, they were having the argument. You two were having the argument, and I just didn't give a shit. I was like, well, I'm not going to win, so why the fuck do I care? You were just like, oh, that's a Blumhouse film, though. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen them, but did. I did promote Freaky on here. So. You did? So I guess I, yeah. All right, well, today we are back on with another listener episode. I don't hate all Blumhouse. <laughs> I hate them all. It's good. We're moving on from it. It's okay. okay. Save it for the Blumhouse episode. We're doing one of those? No. Okay. Good. Write in. Tell us if you want it. Yeah. <laughs> and make it happen. It's okay to be wrong. Okay. Uh, yes. Another listener episode. Friend of the show, Aaron, has suggested today's film. Mm-hmm. We are back in Japan. We are back on found footage. And we are checking out Koji Shiraishi's Occult from 2009. So glad that we have you here for all the pronunciations. Because I was like, well, we're fucked. I will do my best. Well, we're gonna be, yeah. Listening to the disclaimer, fifth. we none of us speak Japanese. Sometimes the the language can be a little. Difficult I mean, I can't even them. pronounce Fibonacci's correctly. <laughs> so, we're... Uh, but first, like always, we're gonna warm up a bit and talk about what we've been watching mm-hmm. in this post Halloween world that we're now in. Well, you know, as the wide bar, the wise bards ministry said, every day is Halloween, Dustin. So, and everyone's entitled to one good scare. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> and evil dies tonight. Uh huh. Because forty years ago, forty if evil. If you don't think evil dies tonight, well, fuck you. <laughs> evil dies tonight. Okay. Did anybody have a good one? I did. Okay. No. Let's sandwich it. We'll do bad, good, okay. bad. <laughs> All right. So, Jason, you do bad. Okay, I'll do bad. I have another warning for everyone out there. <laughs> You're like turning into the crazy Ralph of this podcast. It's going to death cut. Don't watch this movie. You're all doomed. He's just hanging out in a closet waiting to come out. It, it's, so, <laughs> it's so tempting to watch this movie, too. It's called The Call. Mm-hmm. That's a cool name. It is a cool name. It's a recent movie. It's 2020. Um, it's set in the 80s. That's a bonus for me right there. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay. Um, it's got Lynn Shay in it. Yeah, she's cool. Major bonus. I'm in. Uh, (laughs) I thought thought you were about to say major boner. Well, I I mean, you know. Okay, cool. This is how this is going. All right. Lynn Shea's a handsome woman. (laughs) Uh, It's got Tobin Bell. Yeah, he's a handsome handsome woman, too. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Shut the fuck up. He's going to make you play a game, dude. You better watch (laughs) out. No, thank you. Um, I'll give the little blurb here. It doesn't uh, IMDb, but in the fall of 1987, a group of small town friends must survive the night in the home of a sinister couple after a tragic accident brings them to the couple's door. Sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. I love those types of, you know, bottle type movies where it takes place in one location, especially if you've got an old spooky house, but oh, the premise is good. The, the, the setup is fine. But, oh, man, do not watch this movie. Avoid it. It's directed by Timothy Woodward Jr. Is that like Tom Woodward Jr.'s? Is that a name we kid? should recognize for anything? Or? See, I didn't th- he's actually done a lot of movies, and I haven't seen any of the others, so I can't speak to those. But none of them really look like horror films. That could be an issue. But mm-hmm. one of my biggest complaints, uh, the, the plot was just way too thin. It just it didn't support... You know, what was there, it was just, um, and the effects, oh man. It was like, it used those like jittery missing frame effects, like from the early 2000s with the monsters and stuff. Not a fan. Mm, yeah. Not a just, fan of that. Oh, it, it was just, it was pretty amateurish. The effect is either good enough to show or you don't show it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Because you can still create an effective film without showing the monster. I mean, Jaws is a living example of you can still create suspense sure. without showing right everything. Oh, yeah. But why do such a hackneyed, you know, tired cliche thing? It's just I mean, I know it's a low budget movie, but I mean Where did you watch it? Uh, I watched it on in, in his basement. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> right here, I'll see actually. more, you know, the streaming service I'm or pretty sure it was shuttered. Let me double check. In the backseat of a Volkswagen. <laughs> Very uncomfortable place. Uh, the internet. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so I just I just gotta warn everyone about this one. Just it, it looks appetizing, but don't do it. Sounds like a regular Cthulhu's mansion. <laughs> oh wait, no, this is a Japanese film. This one looks a lot better. <laughs> uh, 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 it's on Netflix. Well, oh, that's any good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Probably not. Tune in next time. Find out who this other movie that's the same name. I'm going to watch every this. movie called The Call, and I will report on all of them. Will you also watch the um, Raven films, like The Call? Oh, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that reminds me of the uh, the movie The Roost. Oh yeah, that was by. Um, that's Ty West, right? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, didn't, I was not a fan of that one either. Um, <laughs> this was on, this was on Prime bats? Video. Was it the roost about bats? Yeah, but roost makes me think of crows, caw. They're not the know. same animal. I they're know not they're even... not the same animal. I know they're not the same genus. I know this. I'm just saying it reminded me of that. Caw! Don't watch the roost either. So uh, I watched a movie and I actually liked it. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you care to share? Yes. I. You actually watched this too, so you can share oh. in my enjoyment of this. I will. Uh we actually watched it with Adam, speaking of. Mm-hmm. Uh, we checked out Bloody Muscle, Bodybuilder, in Hell. Yeah. Directed by Shinichi Fukuzawa. It's his only film. Sadly. Sadly. Uh, it was actually made in the 90s and kind of took all the way up till 2012 to get a proper release. Uh, it's also billed as the Japanese Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. And it's a very simple story about this guy named Naoto, who's a bodybuilder, and he gets a call from his ex-girlfriend, who's a photojournalist, about uh, checking out uh, some haunted houses. And they go to investigate it, they bring along a psychic, and it's a house that was once owned by Naoto's father, where apparently some sinister things have gone on, and it's now cursed and haunted. Mm Mm-hmm. And unleashes a 30-year vengeful grudge. <laughs> like so many Japanese houses, apparently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the real estate market must be a bitch there. <laughs> well, this house is actually not haunted. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but you're going to pay for that. It's a premium. Uh, so, you know, it's it's very low budget. There's some very questionable effects in this. but <laughs> They're charming, though. It is so much fun to watch. And yeah. they just have such a great time with it. And it's infectious to watch it. And, like, you can't help but smile. Right. As it's going on. It's a complete love letter to the Evil Dead. I think my favorite thing, too, is they, they get that timing so right of where, like, something will happen, and everything resolves, and it stops. And then just suddenly, instantly, bam, and everything is going again. The music swells back up. Right. That's a hard kind of, like, comedic timing to nail, I mm-hmm. think. But they it's did it very well. a key testament to a good editor mm-hmm. as well, which I was actually thinking earlier today, like, how... Editors get glossed over. So important. Like, and you don't realize Mm -hmm. how important a a good editor. It's an essential piece. And they tend to not really get a lot of recognition. Unless you're, like, from the editor. If it wasn't for the editors, Star Wars would not have been (laughs) watchable. Yeah, Yeah, it's super fun. One second, there'll be this great gore with blood splattering everywhere. And then the next second, it'll be, like, a hand-drawn picture of, like, a monster. It's very strange. Very strange. I'm not going to say it's a good movie. But it's a very fun movie. Yes. Would you no, say it's, that it's, it's definitely art, better it's to watch like with people? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. A couple of beers in you. Not not one to sit around and watch on your own. No. And it's only like, I want to say 60, 62 minutes or yeah. something, too. So it's you're not wasting your time. They just like, boom, hit it all and go. It yeah. doesn't stay longer than it needs to. Right. Mm-hmm. And actually, I watched this on a release from Midori Impulse, which I wanted to talk about for a quick second, because I am a collector and I love all these different labels. Mm-hmm. They're actually a label based in Germany. And they're focused mostly on Japanese cinema, and they're really trying to get like weird stuff that doesn't really have releases anywhere else, like this film. Such a strange... Yes. Like... Uh, so if you do collect films, there's someone you should go look up. I'll put it in the show notes. They have a lot of stuff that you're not going to find anywhere else, that if you like Asian cinema, definitely they're one to keep an eye on. Uh, they do these cool like media book releases that are very fancy. It's, I don't know how to even describe those. I see them more of like CDs, I think, than films yeah. often. Um, but yeah, they're very cool, interesting covers. Uh, they are, you know, regioned for uh, Germany, so you're gonna need like an all-region player or something. Which, if you are a collector, oh, probably should get one of those. I would say, yeah, they're good to have. I have to say that I think it. I really like when companies take the time, like, because it's gonna be a premium. Mm-hmm. You're gonna pay a premium price for the product, and I appreciate it when companies take the time to make it feel worth. Oh yeah, what you paid for it, like. Ah. 
as much as I love some of the, I don't want to shit on some of the labels because they give us great stuff, mm-hmm. but like, I don't know. When you buy a DVD or a Blu-ray that's a special edition and it's really just like a shitty ass crumpled up slip case. <laughs> and, and it's like 40 bucks. Yeah. And it's 40 bucks. I'm like, come on, man. Like make me feel yeah. like I'm paying for something that I, that feels like a premium $40 disc. Like these, these are like the media book format they're using. They're the kind that's like, I would like to pull them out of the shelf and kind of like actually display them. Nice. Because they look that good. It's like with vinyl, you know, mm-hmm. like you're always, even though I don't collect vinyl, like I'm, I'm still a sucker for a good gatefold. Like I, will, oh, yeah. I see that <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, I don't collect vinyl, but I feel like dropping $40 on that because it looks awesome. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. so Bloody Muscle, Bodybuilder in Hell, AKA the Japanese Evil Dead. Go check it out. Yeah, this one's actually somewhat attainable, at least. Yep. Well, mine's very attainable. You can watch it on Hulu. Really? Oh. Dude, everything I watch is But should you? (laughs) No, unfortunately. All right, so I'd I'd been wanting to watch this. came out last year, um, Shadow in the Cloud. Have you guys heard of that one? Oh, my God. Is that the one with uh, Chloe Grace Moretz? Yeah. I I saw like part of a trailer of that and I still have no idea what it's about. <laughs> but it looked dumb as hell. I that. watched it and I don't know entirely. No, I do know what it's about. Okay. Um and actually the funny thing is I'm I was reading the synopsis on IMDb and the synopsis is even wrong. <laughs> they don't actually know. The synopsis says a female World War II pilot traveling with top secret documents on a B17 flying fortress encounters an evil presence on board the flight. Oh, oh, I know cool. the, I know the trailer of this. Now I thought that would be like a very straightforward kind of film. Was well, that a segment in heavy metal? Um, it, <laughs> there's so many reasons why this should work. Mm-hmm. Um, cool premise. You keep it at a tight premise. You don't keep a big set, so you can kind of work in a, you know, the claustrophobia thing and all that. Yeah, sure. but also um, female director uh, Roseanne Leong. So I'm I'm always kind of seeking out female director in horror because oh, yeah. I think it's super under represented so i also love chloe grace moretz i think she's phenomenal she's amazing like she's oh, so she's, always, she's been one of my favorites for a long time she's so good i mean you're sitting here telling me the film's bad and i'm kind of just over here thinking well you know i could still just watch it though yeah, because she's in it that's yeah. so here's where the film gets has problems um it it looks really cool when it mm-hmm. starts like it has a good uh palette to it like the the tone is really cool the soundtrack is really banging it's like this techno um like dance techno so it's not era appropriate no but it but it's it's really cool jason's out <laughs> but they I hate re- anachronistic music <laughs> 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 he'd prefer a bugler <laughs> um but they end up like when she gets on board this plane everybody's like why the fuck's a dame on here you know like and they really sell hard that chauvinistic language, which Mm -hmm. I'm not saying wouldn't be the case, Mm -hmm. but she also showed up with orders from a higher ranking officer. Yeah. And I'm like, "Eh, you wouldn't talk shit. Like you wouldn't say that much stuff. Well, they end up sticking her in the gunner, like the, what's it called? Like under the B 17s. The belly. It's the belly, (laughs) but it's like that turret thing Mm -hmm. that sits underneath it. Ventral. They they end up sticking her under there for almost 40 minutes of the film. And she's under there by herself for 40 minutes of the film. So every other character she's interacting with is all through a comm headset. Hmm. And that's putting a lot of pressure on her to sell the film, which she does fine. But it just, you feel it. You're like, how much longer is mm. she going to be sitting under here with nothing <laughs> happening? And so the premise of the film, though, is that there is something mysterious, like, on the wing of the plane. <laughs> it's on the wing. You don't Gremlins. Say. And it is legitimately called a gremlin. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's kind of fun. Um, the creature effect is really rough. Mm. It's some pretty rough CG. Like original Twilight Zone rough? Kind Dying of. Dying the carpet? Or? It's definitely an homage. Uh. Like, it's definitely kind of play into that. But there's just not an... It's one of my pet peeves is like when you don't have the budget, don't go beyond what you can do Mm -hmm. and sell it. And so they really had the budget for the plane, but they just didn't leave the budget for the monster. Mm. (laughs) Um, 
it really just kind of the storyline kind of devolves into things that I'm like, okay, why did you need to go there? Mm-hmm. I don't feel this was necessary. That's unfortunate. So I'm not mad that I watched it. I still think um, Chloe Grace Mortez's performance is awesome in it. And honestly, she carries the film 100%. But I think it was just had so much potential and then it didn't do any of that. And it was just such a letdown. Hmm. But it is on Hulu. So if you have Hulu, you can watch it for free, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. So, Shadow in the Cloud. It's a bummer. But I finally watched it. All right. So, listener episode. Koji Shiraishi, Occult 2009. I feel like we need some heavy hitting music right there. Like a <laughs> listener episode. Are you the music <laughs> guy? That's all you. Yeah. Who edits this? Is that it? Is that going to be the music? <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm just recording that, playing it over it. Sweet. You can try it. Um, so, this is a very prolific Japanese director when it comes to horror. So, I thought the best place to start before we even get into the film is to talk about him a little bit. Because he's got a pretty interesting background and a lot of films that if you enjoy this at all, you're definitely going to want to go check out the rest of his filmography. If you can. If you can. It is quite hard. We're going to get into that. Yeah. Mm. Big discussion on this for this episode. So, uh, his first feature was actually in 2004. He had done some shorts before then, but it was called Juray the Uncanny. And it was kind of sort of like a riff on The Grudge. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very inspired by it. I actually have it because of all things when they did that whole boom of like, let's put every Japanese horror thing ever on DVD. Uh, This was one of those that just randomly got a release. I remember seeing the cover. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it's not great. It is interesting because it's basically like they filmed a grudge-style film in chapters, just like, mm. you know, how they do. And then they took it, and they play the chapters in reverse. So the first thing you see is like the end of the movie, a chunk of it. Then it goes to like one chunk before that, then one chunk before that. And so a lot of the film is like, how did the curse start? And then you trace it back to the beginning Hmm. Okay. It makes it weird, though, because the first thing you see is, like, the biggest moment and the best scare. Right. And then as it traces back, it kind of, like, ramps down Hmm. until you get to the very, like, inciting point, and then it, like, shoots back up again. So it's a weird kind of, like, reverse thing about how the scares work. Okay. I mean, if there's one thing that I learned from a cult is that the dude's really not afraid to do anything. Oh, no. Like, if... It's if it's in his mind, like sure, I'm gonna try that. Like fuck it, I'm trying it. So, I mean, that's something you don't get that often. <laughs> True. Uh, a little bit about him: his favorite Japanese director is Sogo Ishii. He particularly loves his 1980 film Crazy Thunder Road. Uh, other directors he cites as really liking and admiring, and looking up to, include John Carpenter, uh, Brian De Palma, mm-hmm. and Sam Raimi. Nice. Uh, some films he's kind of rattled off in interviews before. Uh, the original Dawn of the Dead, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, The Thing, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. All classics. All classics, all good stuff. Um, he's very known for this found footage kind of mockumentary style, which Occult is in and several of his other ones are. Uh, the big one is Noroi the Curse from 2005. Mm-hmm. That had a huge underground hype following when it came out. And it took all these years to get a U.S. release for Shudder. It was like one of the first Shutter originals where they licensed it and picked it up when they so got into crazy. that format. Yeah. Yeah, and it's insane because it's like, it's maybe my favorite found footage film. I just wow. think it's incredibly good. Hmm. I liked it. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> it was acceptable. Yeah, if, you, if you're sitting there with Shutter and you've not watched it yet, you need to just like immediately go and check it out because it's incredible. Um, he's done a handful of others in that style. The one today we're talking about in 2010, he did Shirome, which I thought was worth mentioning just because <laughs> random side note for the podcast, but I super love idol music from Japan. Mm-hmm. And the whole premise of Shirome is it's a documentary following an idol group, Memorial Clover. And it sort of blends reality and fiction, all of the ways that a cult does as well. 
but it's kind of like them exploring an urban legend. Like it's supposed to be a variety show that they're filming for TV. Okay. And then it like traces the line between like, well, is this just a show or is something supernatural really happening? Hmm. Uh, so that's very interesting premise. Uh, outside of found footage, he's done a lot of other just straight J horror films, particularly ones based on like urban legends or ghost stories. Uh, in 2007, he made carved, which is about the slit mouth woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he did the Teke Teke films, which I actually talked about yeah. in an earlier episode. Yeah, it's the one you can't see that sounds really freaking cool. Yep. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, he's also dabbled in extreme horror, which is a thing we keep dancing around talking oh, about at some point. Not much longer. Uh, 2009, the exact same year as this film, he also released Grotesque, which was straight up one of those like guinea pig send-ups where it's just a guy, he abducts people, and it's all shot in one location, and it's pretty much just him you know, torturing them into oblivion. Have you seen it? Yes. I liked it. It's really good. Yeah. Very tough to watch though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not an easy watch, but it's, <laughs> I liked it. It's actually on my everyday playlist <laughs> I to get up every morning with that. Well, that's my thing with extreme horror. And maybe we can go into it a little more in an episode for that, but it's like, I never, I never go out to like seek those, but I'll hear about one and it'll get recommended to me. And uh, then I'll, I usually seek them out. Watch it. I've been that way about the sadness this year. Mm. I still need to see that. Like it's made a lot of waves and you know big splashes in the horror community, but I'm still like I just don't know if I want to see it. Like I want to see it, but I don't want to see it. Kind of a thing, which I think is probably the point of extreme horror. Like I want to see that, yeah, but I don't want to see it. So, yeah, right. Um. So notably, that film though, uh, it got banned and refused classification in the United Kingdom. Of course. The uh, director of the British Board of Film Classification said about it, unlike other recent torture-themed horror films like Saw or Hostel, Grotesque features minimal narrative or character development and presents the audience with little more than an unrelenting and escalating scenario of humiliation, brutality, and sadism. In spite of any vestigial attempt to explain the killer's motivations at the end, the chief pleasure on offer is not related to understanding the motivations of any of the central characters. I think he was just describing a session of Parliament. Probably, yeah. <laughs> he was just, he got confused and he's like, oh, oh yeah, that's us. That's us. We're the ones who do that. Well, I think we know and it's established we all hate censorship on this show. Yep. So people like that are just, bah, I don't get them. Yeah. I, um, think they, I think we have a right to protect people who shouldn't see these things. Like you at least need to put something on it to say like yeah. the material here is not suitable. Sure. I don't think right, anyone for that that's age. what ratings are for. Yeah, like that's know? what we're supposed to do. But then at the same time, like if everybody involved in it was consensual, then fucking show it. I don't care. Right. Yeah. Like if I don't want to watch it, I won't watch it. Yeah, let us decide if we can handle it or not, if we should watch it. If yeah. If Ugh. Okay. <laughs> anyway. And of course, uh, Shiraishi took it in stride. He said he was flattered that it got that much of a reaction out of them. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Such an awesome uh, Japanese response, too. So yeah, he's done these low budget, like urban legendy films. He's done these found footage films. He's done extreme horror. And in more recent years, he's done these, you know, bigger budgeted, like studio films in Japan. Uh, 2016, he did the Ring Grudge crossover, Sadako versus Kayako. I still haven't watched that. Which is also a Shutter original. <laughs> you can check it out on there. Um,. If you go in expecting some sort of serious blending of the lore of both franchises, it's not going to happen. Is it better or worse than Freddy vs. Jason? It depends on what you go in, I think. Because <laughs> when I first watched it, I was like, oh, this is going to be like some ultimate like culmination of both. It's very goofy. It's very over the top. It's very fun. It plays very loosely with the lore and it kind of just matches everything up. But it's really like a good send up to it. Just not like a true continuation in any way. Okay. So, can you spoil who won? Uh, do you want me to? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> or is it like one of those Godzilla versus Kong things where they say like Mothra and they're like, how do you know that name? And then they team up. Check it out. It's on Shudder. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I might have hit the... Uh... You, you won't predict the ending, I bet. Uh, and then his most recent film from 2019 is a live-action adaptation of Hellgirl, which I've also talked about before on this show. And you also can't see. And you also can't see it because it doesn't have a proper release. Um, <sighs> so yeah, he's quite the talented director, quite versatile. He's one of my favorites, so I had to do a little rant about him and an appreciation cool. of his work. Nice. All right. So I think we should go ahead and get the elephant in the room here about how we watched a cult since 
you can't get it. It's on YouTube. There is no proper release for this film in the U.S., which is where we are based. So, which was one of my... It kind of put me off about doing this episode because I don't... I am not a proponent of piracy. I don't think any of us are. No. So, there are many people who will just be like, well, if it's not available, it's okay to pirate. And I'm like, I think you cross a pretty big gray area when you start saying things like that because then... There are plenty of legal ways to get a lot of things. Like Mm -hmm. Dustin has said, there's all region Blu ray players. All region players. But what if it doesn't exist, even in that form? And that's where it gets tricky. And thankfully, this was out there floating on the internet that was not an illegal way to watch it, Um, but still not an ideal way to watch it. I don't know of the legality of it. You would think YouTube would take it down. It could just be one of those things that slipped through the cracks. Well, what I found it, what I thought was interesting is after I watched this film, I understand why it, I have ideas of why it's not being released. I I think there's a reason. We'll get into that. Um, mm. So it is, it is it's a little, it's a little controversial. So therefore, it's, it's a foreign film. That's why it's not being yeah. released. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can find it out there. I'm not going to put the link in the show notes out of respect to the film because I do hope it gets released one day. And even if it's years down the road, I will go back and edit in where you can buy it. In support of the film. Mm-hmm. But you can find it if you're even remotely... If you can find this podcast, you can probably find... <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I think release-wise, it has like a maybe a German DVD, but that's that's it, really. Yeah. So that was one of my hang-ups, but mm-hmm. I was glad that at least it was viewable. Sure. We didn't have to resort to like Pirate Bay and shit like that, of like trying to torrent it. Mm-hmm. And I, stuff like I that. don't even mess with that. I don't do that at all. I don't either. I don't. I don't agree with anyone who does do it. <laughs> and the other thing is, um, if Dustin, <laughs> bro, what? <laughs> I'm the collection master over here. <laughs> uh, master of something. Mm. Baiting, <laughs> baiting. <laughs> so, um, the one takeaway from this though is that hopefully in talking about this, you flustered him. He's down. You uh, broke his programming. Hopefully in talking about this, it will raise you know kind of the awareness of this film. More people will know about it, want to seek it out. Yes, throw our support behind it. And some boutique label will hear us our podcast and then get it. And ah, yes, it out there are twelve least. people in the United <laughs> States that would like to buy this film. <laughs> Do if Arrow wants to make the UK version and then the US version, I'll buy it twice. What I wonder though, like. <laughs> It would be interesting to know if the director, the director's thoughts on it not being released, or does he even give a shit? I doubt he even cares. I mean, most Japanese filmmakers, I think they pretty much just make their stuff for Japan. Uh, America it, is not a market for them. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious. I'm sure they, you know, love it and respect if other, you know, other people get to see it and they. But I mean, like, find it interesting. It's not available on a Japanese release that you know of, is it? I think there is a Japanese release, but you know, there's no subtitles, so we. As people who do not speak Japanese have no means of no. getting at it. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Be pretty obtuse without understanding what they're saying, especially in this film with how <laughs> intricate the plot. Yeah, is. Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, what is the plot? Okay, so very simply, here's a synopsis. It doesn't even kind of begin to get into everything, but Koji Suraishi, as himself, is interested in strange, indiscriminate murders that happened at a sightseeing resort. He goes behind the camera to investigate the circumstances and the strange events that surround it and interview the various survivors. Yeah, that's not really... That's like the first ten minutes of the film. Yeah, yeah, that's set up. Then that that shifts pretty (laughs) heavily. Um, So the film basically starts off as most found footage films or like documentary style Hmm. things where they kind of set up. We came across it with like Devil's Pass and stuff like that too. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, here's our set, here's our problem. You got the title card. Yeah, yeah. this is where we're gonna go. Um, I already found it creepy. I honestly, I found the opening creepy. The opening little piece of score music that plays, I love that track. It sounds like someone took a dial-up modem, recorded it, and then like remixed it. Yeah, the music is very good in the movie, and it's not frequent because often when it's the you know interview scenes, they just have no music under right. it. But the few moments it. they punctuate with score just like hit so yeah, hard. It's, it's like a minimalist techno type thing. Mm-hmm. It's really good. It sounds like a bunch of shit just crashing together, and like it all just kind of. But that's kind of how the film felt for me a lot too. I was like a bunch of shit just crashing together. But what I thought was really interesting is from the, even the opening sequence, 
I was expecting more blood mm-hmm. and that there isn't any. Right. Like hardly any at Not all. Very little. Which I thought was really interesting because that's a testament to a good filmmaker that you can create an atmosphere that's so creepy and haunting. One, in broad daylight. And two, without using special effects to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like literally just how do I frame this? How do I shoot it? And how do I get my people to react? Right. And, and it, it's all very naturalistic too, I think. Like I would believe this was just like some documentary. Yeah. If I stumbled across it's presented it. presented as footage shot by uh, like a trio of girls, right? Mm-hmm. And even the aspect ratio is in 4-3. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, the from, initial footage. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, so it's very rough, very amateurish. It looks, you know, I mean, I would believe it if I saw it. And then you hear someone screaming, right? And mm-hmm. someone starts running onto the bridge they're on. And you can tell they're like flailing with a knife. Yeah. And kind of the setup we're given is that in 2005, at a resort area called Miyogasaki, there was this incident where a man named Ken Matsuki killed two people and injured a third. And after finishing this, he kind of walked to the cliff edge and dove and was never found. They don't know if he died, if he escaped, what happened. It was such a funny scene of him jumping off that cliff, too. Like, it's very, it's just funny because it's obvious that he's jumping into something, like, to catch him. Mm -hmm. But it just looks like he just straight up yeets himself (laughs) off of it. Like, (laughs) yeet! (laughs) He's just gone. But it is a haunting moment because the girl with the camera, she notices him, like, kind of curving around to go up on the cliffside. And she follows him and is watching. Yeah. And then she just it just like lingers on him, and he like stands there a moment, and then just dives over the edge. And so the filmmakers, the the documentarians, mm-hmm. um, start following the survivors and of this attack, and they interview one specific survivor that was he was stabbed multiple times, um, but it turns out he was actually scarred in a pattern. Yep, his name is Shohei Eno. And uh, that was a creepy scene, too, where they show the guy just stabbing Eno, and he's, like, crying for help and stuff mm-hmm. like that. There's some things that kind of lost me there, though, like, that I didn't feel were super connected to the story. Like, when they interviewed the guy who was going to propose to... So, interestingly, the people that die, they speak to some of their loved ones. Right. And it's more of just, like, building this initial documentary story, I think. And they do loop back around in the end, I think. But maybe you've missed a, a little bit of the connecting pieces. I think I did. So the first one is they talk to one of the girl's mothers. And she talks about how she has dreams of her daughter. Mm-hmm. And that she'll show up at the door and she's trying to say something, which she thinks is let me inside. And she says, you know, welcome home. You can come back. And she laughs and vanishes. And then there's the one guy. He was engaged to one of the girls that was murdered. Right. And he sees her. Mm-hmm. He swears that he sees her. Yep. like, And he has a photo where he went out drinking with friends, and she is like in the background walking by, kind of like turning to the camera in that moment. So, f- for me, I didn't feel how that ended up connecting. But I, I think I might have gotten... Let me try to loop it in later, once okay. we get deeper into this, the mystery of what's going on. There's some other weirdness, too, where each of these individuals that were involved in this incident... They all had a weird sort of situation that happened to them that kind of drew them to go to Miyogasaki. Right. They felt like they needed to be um, there. The uh, the fiance of the girl, she saw it in a magazine, and they start talking about it, and then they just get so jazzed up, they immediately run out, rent a car, and drive there. Um, the girl with the camera, what was it? She had a dream or something about going there, I want to say. Something like that, yeah. And then Inno's thing is that he heard a voice on TV that told him he had to go there which he thought maybe he was just hearing weird things or something, but then he like changed the channel and it was this show about the area and like a you know travel show, like why you would want to visit there. Right. And he says later in the interview that he was living a really shitty life mm-hmm. beforehand. And so he thought maybe this was something that was supposed to help him. Yeah, he heard a voice, didn't he? Yeah, he thought that by going there, something would happen and it would make his life better. Right. Cause he was, yeah. Um, that's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I, is this where the mountain is? That's a way into it. Okay. We got a little bit more ground to cover right. first. Uh, so, these little side stories about, like, the relatives, I think they're pretty sad, pretty well executed the way they are. Like, they really, like, build some emotion. Mm-hmm. They are. I mm-hmm. didn't care for those because they made me sad. Mm-hmm. And I want to bring up, and this will be a contentious thing, mm-hmm. uh, Lake Mungo. I think that this does that better. 
I'm not sure if it does it better. I know for some reason, Lake Mungo didn't land for you. I, I like it a lot. It, it landed. It was good for me. Yeah, I think it's a great movie. I don't know. I was very um, re- like repulsed from it, and I think that in his uh, Shiraishi's films, I see like that authenticity that I want to see in Lake Mungo, but didn't. Okay, but that yet everyone else I mean, does. I, I agree. This part in the movie is effective. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, this it's kind of like if you break this film down, it's in four chapters. Is kind of how I looked at it. So this first chapter is the event at Miyogasaki and what happened, and we learn about all the people, and we learn a little bit about the killer, uh, Ken Matsuki. He was born with this strange birthmark that resembles the markings that he stabbed into Inno. Mm-hmm. It's this sort of like eyeball shaped symbol with some like lines attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um. And they do the whole, like, what you would expect of a documentary where they talk to some people that knew him, one of his friends from college. And they're like, yeah, you know, he was just a normal guy. He, I think the friend says he was interested in the occult and ghosts, but it was never anything, like, alarming or weird or strange. Right. It was very creepy when they interviewed his dad. Mm-hmm. That was really sad. Like, his dad looked just completely... Mm-hmm. But also, I think that's a cultural thing, too. Like, if you're in a society that's so strict on like image and Mm -hmm. respect and everything like that's kind of going to kill your own image. If your kid turns out to be a mass murderer. Yeah. Kind of a thing. It doesn't really, I think here in the States it can probably, they actually kind of dealt with that in that movie. Um, Oh, we need to talk about Kevin. Well, we've got oh, more yeah. killers in this country. So, you know, more people have had to deal with it. <laughs> that's it's true. Not yeah. so unusual. <laughs> that's true. Um, but yeah, the one thing we do know is that with this birthmark thing, I think it's the dad that says it. Um, as a little kid, Ken would say he was like chosen by God. Yeah, That's God marked was, him. Yeah. yeah. Which it turns out to be a, kind of a kicker for the story wise mm-hmm. for the rest of the film is like being, quote, marked by God. And I think the last interesting thing about this we need to cover before we move on is that uh, when he is stabbing the scars into Inno, he says something to him and he says, it's your turn now. Mm-hmm. And Which when they... initially you think, oh, your turn to die. That's why I'm stabbing you. Mm-hmm. I don't think I, I know that's what the film wanted you to think. Oh, I, I didn't either. But yeah, I never thought <laughs> I, that. I think if you've seen enough movies, you know, that's not as discerning right. horror fans. We know that's not what <laughs> yeah. it is. I was, I was like, Jason, you really thought that? Okay. <laughs> Um, (laughs) but that kind of brings us to what I would say is the second chapter of this film, which is following Inno in his life. Mm -hmm. He's sort of like the main person they choose to focus on because as they're first interviewing him, he says, well, you know, ever since then, sometimes I've heard a voice trying to talk to me. I've seen weird things. I noticed a UFO when I got out of the hospital. He sees miracles. He calls them miracles. I, what is the dude done other than this movie? The guy who plays Eno. Yeah. He's right. He's very good. He is what the is most... the actor's name? Because I'm having trouble finding exactly who plays this character. I feel like he is the most believable person. Yeah, that like you'd just be talking to this dude, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I see miracles. Yeah, right. I know. Like, it's kind of a weird thing that happened to me, but I guess everything's good now. Yeah, it's just the... he's, he's very believable. He's great. All the conversations that they have with him are just they're both sad. Like, I think the actor does such a great job of imbuing like a sadness and a desperation Mm -hmm. into the character without making it over the top or feel like he's truly acting, Mm -hmm. which I think is its own. I mean like in under the silver Lake. I agree (laughs) completely, (laughs) but you know what I'm saying? Like (laughs) if he were to overdo this, yeah, it would never feel like a real person. It would never feel like a documentary or found footage. And it's obviously he has some problems because he doesn't have any money. Mm -hmm. He's asking to borrow so I'm pretty sure it's Shohei Uno. Shohei Uno. The actor. Okay. He's been in a ton of films. Well, he's very good. Yeah, he's great. He has um, quite a prolific uh, filmography. His character, basically, like Jason said, he has no money. Um, he's a temp worker. Right. So he's always trying to get these temp jobs that really don't pay that much. And it's the first thing that kind of doesn't add up about him because he says, like, the way he phrases it at first is, like, he went and had this experience and it was bad, but it turned his life around. And then when you learn what his life is now, it's like, well, it kind of sucks, though, yeah. dude. Like, how, how bad was your life before? Well, but I looked at that a little different because mm-hmm. of all the time that I spent in the church mm-hmm. that so many people will have their reborn moment. Oh, okay. 
and be like, it really turned my life around. And I'm like, you're still living a pretty shitty ass life. (laughs) But in their mind, they're like, well, now I have some reason to have faith. You know, like I can survive all this because now I have this newfound. I can see that. Yeah, that's a good idea. So that's kind of how I viewed it. But also at the same time, it's hard to look at his life and be like, yeah, you're really a, <laughs> really doing great there, man. Yeah. Because he buys all of his food at... The 100 yen shop. Yeah, the 100 yen shop. Which I did not know Japan had a dollar store, too. That was awesome. Oh, yeah, they have numerous ones. That was great. But what I thought was really interesting, and it just kind of shows the... Uh, kind of the weirdness of the character and, like, the... Was it him, like, weighing the packages? Yeah, he weighs food based on, will it fill my stomach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he's picking up food and, like, holding it. Yeah, he'll get, like, bags of chips and, like, level them against one another. and It's just this real quirkiness of this guy. Yeah, they give him a camera. They say, hey, keep this camera with you. If you catch these miracles, we'll we'll pay you money. Actually, even before that, the first thing is Shiraishi decides, I'm going to follow him for, like, a day. And just see if I can get anything. Yeah. And that's where we learn, like, the ins and outs of his actual job, which is that he's a temp worker, and he has to, like, call every morning and be like, hey, do you have any work for me? And it's just this total crapshoot of, like, maybe they have a job, or if not, you don't get anything. He sleeps in a manga cafe. Mm -hmm. Like, basically, where he even says, like, they're great. You can use their air conditioning. You can use their microwave. You can take a shower there. So... It's like, and that might be a foreign concept if you've not watched a lot of Japanese cinema or like engaged in that culture at all. But these places, like, you can go and just like rent time there and get a little room with like a computer to browse the internet. They have huge libraries of manga that you can read. It was interesting to it to me that was just it showed the resourcefulness of his of his character because mm-hmm. you'll see why he needed to be resourceful later. Mm-hmm. In the film, but I think you're already seeing the resourcefulness of the character that, like, he's figured out a way to navigate. Yeah, to this point, it's like, if this is the life he has, he's found a way to make it viable. Yeah, it's still shitty. It's still pretty rough. Um, And the other, I think, notable thing to talk about here is that in the morning, when he's getting ready, he goes to, like, buy some food or something, and he bums 100 yen off of Shiraishi. Yeah. And it's just a little, like, you put your pen in it and think about it, but it eventually is, like, a big deal later on. It, uh, I had actually just watched Squid Game and kind of reminded me of that scene in Squid Game when he's like, has all the money, but mm-hmm. he's still like, can I borrow? Yeah, he probably just stole it from this, so. <laughs> <laughs> I only brought it up because I just wanted to watch that fire build in Dustin for yeah. him to be like, fuck that show. God damn, fuck it. Oh, I hate Squid Game. We won't get into it, but, uh, maybe another time. I just like to light the little embers there and just <laughs> fun. blow on them and let them just fan into flames. Oh, I love you guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, he gets, he doesn't get any work. His funds are looking bad. Shiraishi feels sorry for him and actually buys him some food. It's, they try to hide the fact that it's McDonald's, but it's very clearly McDonald's. Yes. <laughs> and we finally get our, our miracle. They're mm-hmm. just sitting at the table, they're talking. <laughs> And then the rapper kind of like blows away just out of nowhere. There's no breeze. Nothing else is going on. Pretty shitty miracle. Yeah. All things considered. Shiraishi's kind of like, what? And then, you know, says, oh, that's, that's the miracle. That's what was going to happen. And it does repeat itself. He like puts it back up on Mm -hmm. the table and it immediately blows off again. I looked at, so I had an interesting thought in my head though, because I was thinking about how this played back to some of our other episodes of stuff that we had watched and we talked a lot about magical thinking. See, I had some connections there too, I thought, yeah. And people who genuinely believe, I think this, I mean, we talked about how this happens now, mm. that when you start looking for things like that, and you're right, like... it's synchronicities, weird things that don't seem to make sense, but they might have some sort of special meaning to you. Mm-hmm. So for for him, like, okay, I got stabbed and carved up, and like I now have this weird pattern on my back, and some dude told me, it's your turn now. Like, that's a very traumatic event that he needs to make sense of Mm -hmm. somehow. So for him, it's now, like, this is how he's making sense of it. Like, I've got to start looking for these, quote, miracles, Mm -hmm. or this this was just a really shitty thing that happened to me. Yeah. And I don't think that's too much of a foreign concept for a lot of people. No. I think we're all jaded motherfuckers (laughs) in this room. And we'd be like, no, nah, it's just a really shitty thing that happened to you. <laughs> but I think for a lot of people, it wouldn't be. That would hey, be a I, very... I want to believe. 
okay. <laughs> if you turn into this guy, I'm. I'm <laughs> Um, but this is where we get to what you're talking about, Jason. They they bring him to their office, and he makes some funny comments when they get there. He's like, it's like a little apartment they've converted into an office. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh, do you live here? And the, it's so the, big. The producer's <laughs> like, no, this is just our office. Yeah, he's like, do you sleep here? It's like, no, no, this is our office. <laughs> and so, yeah, what they decide is like, hey, if we give you a camera and you just film yourself all the time, if you find any of these miracles and you can get it on film, we will pay you. Because mm-hmm. they're feeling sorry for him and they want to help him out. He's almost at the end of his rope with his money. But they also see potential to mm-hmm. see, like, how often would you get to look in from the mind and the viewpoint of the subject that you're looking for? And, like, what do they view? Mm-hmm. What are they seeing as the miracle? Yeah. So it's a win-win. And then this is where Eno starts to get a little weird. Because <laughs> he starts bumming cigarettes off the producer. Oh, I loved that scene so much. He's like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's like, what about those cigarettes you had? He's like, you can have those too. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, Thank he, you. He asked Thank for you. one Thank earlier you. on, and then he's like, oh yeah, those cigarettes. Yeah. Um, but he asked them like, hey, since I don't have a place to stay and I don't have money, can I sleep here at the office? And yeah, and they, they have to huddle, have a little discussion <laughs> yeah. about this. Do we want this guy staying in our office? Oh. This is kind of. I feel like I know this guy though. Yeah. Like I think we all have probably we've have all somebody, had a, you know in our lives. Before. Yeah. That's. <laughs> but yeah, when he's like. But those cigarettes we had earlier, you can have those too. Ah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. It's cool, always just, cool. you know, one more little thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but in the end, they decide, you know, this is an opportunity for their documentary. So they agree to it, and he's going to stay there a week. And they're going to pay him, which he insists on, uh, proportionate to what he finds. Yes. So if he found like triple what they expected, they would pay him triple yep. the money. So then that's when he gets the camera. And he goes to sleep. He basically is talking to the camera right before he goes to sleep, saying, like, I don't know what I'm going to see, but I'm going to make the best of this. This is a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. And he leaves the camera on while he goes to sleep, and that's when we see kind of the first image. Yeah, it's like a little white outline. It looked like an outline of a person. Yeah. But I, I didn't know who it was. But I don't think it mattered, really, who it was. No. I think it was just that we see it, but... He didn't necessarily see it because he was right. asleep, but it's yeah, it's in the footage. Yeah, it's there. It's in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, during this week, he ends up landing another job. It's a regular like you know five day work week kind of thing. Was it vinyl pressing or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, and so he kind of films himself going on about that. But importantly, when he gets this job, and this is this was a turning point in the movie for me watching it he is really excited that he's landed this Mm. gig and he sets up a party for himself yep and this is an important scene and he doesn't really pay for this party he gets some i feel like he got somebody else to pay for it right i think the crew yeah um and they so they go to a a a restaurant it's like a barbecue and he orders like the premium of everything (laughs) yes like the premium of all the meats he gets a draft beer and he's just like guzzling this right, shit. The second he gets it, he drinks the bottle down to half the the ass that he's drinking out and of. And so the crew is like, dude, you don't need to drink like this on an empty stomach. And he's <laughs> like, it's been so long since I've had draft beer. But the reason that I say all this is because as he starts to drink more and he's mm. starting to get a little drunk, his character becomes a little looser. Right. And he's starting to say some things. There's a character we've not talked about too much. Um, she's sort of the face of the documentary. She's the one that's yeah. doing all the interviews. He gets real cruel to her. Real yeah, quick. he does. Um, real jerk. And but it showed like, God, that was he basically becomes a fucking incel. Yeah, like right there, and he basic and he tells her like, you're not even you don't you're not even real with people. Mm-hmm. Like you don't you show no emotion. Like and they just as she starts questioning him as she should. Like okay, well, why should I have to do that? Right. Yeah. Why do I have to be, be unbiased? You know. Why do I have to be what you want me to be? He just he's like, well, you're just a bitch. Yeah. And I just like straight makes it super weird, super awkward, real quick. And I was like, oh fuck! Like this is this guy. This yeah. is who he really so if, is. If you were starting to like this guy, here's a clue you shouldn't. It's yeah. a very interesting <laughs> moment because he starts out so much as like the archetypical lovable loser. Like he's so down on his luck. He's a little unfortunate. Maybe he's a little like too needy sometimes, but mm. you want to like him. And then you see this and it's a 180. Yeah. It's a whole other direction. And when we, when what happens, when the climax of the film happens, I got to thinking about back to this scene a lot. Mm. 
and making some other comparisons, which I'll bring up when we get to it. But uh, yeah, but she leaves in disgust. She gets angry, gets up, walks out, and he's still like dogging on her even as she walks away. Oh yeah, yeah, just like. And the producer's like, "Hey man, you're being rude. Like you have to be polite to other people." And he's just like, "No, it's not about politeness. It's about being real." So after this, after this party or whatever, we kind of move forward, and there is one little bit at the end of the party. Okay. So they, they drink a while longer. The producer falls asleep, seemingly, and it's just Shiraishi and Inno. Right. And that's where Shiraishi starts to try to be like, well, you know, this voice you think you hear, and is asking him questions. And he's like, well, actually, I can understand the voice. And he kind of explains that he thinks that he's been selected by, you know, he calls it, he calls it God. And he says he's supposed to do some sort of, you know, great, great act. Right. The same kind of way that uh, Ken did at Miyogasaki when he stabbed everyone. But at first he says it doesn't have to be murder. Yeah, that's what Shiraishi asked him. He's like, well, are you talking about murder? And he's like, no, it doesn't have to be murder. Yeah. He says, if you're planning on murdering people, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you. Right. <laughs> Which turns interesting. And he does the kind of like documentarian thing where he's like, well, you know, I'm your friend. I would have to yeah. stop you. To, it would be for your own protection. I'm trying to help you. Mm -hmm. This is where I think this is the turning point of the film. Where and I think it's good that it's done this way because you start to get this to for me this is the second half mm -hmm. of the film and you start to see what it's really leading up to and that we really should not like this guy. Yep. And so in the end, what you find out is the producer was like plain, like <laughs> he wasn't actually asleep. He hears everything and he kind of warns Shiraishi that's like you know this guy could be dangerous. He might be plotting to harm people, plotting to kill people. We don't know. We need to be really careful about this going forward. And so I'm a little lost on the timeline, so carry me forward. So now we see more of like his life that he's recording. He sees some more like weird occurrences. But meanwhile, um, Shiraishi is continuing sort of to investigate the ancillary connections that have been coming up. And one of the things they look into is um, it's a manga artist. Her name is Watanabe, and she's known for having automatic writing, which is another cool... like supernatural element they bring into this film mm -hmm. that's the idea that you might be able to like go into a trance state and let like you can channel something a spirit or presence that can kind of guide your hand and write or draw for you if you don't want to use a ouija board you can do that <laughs> <laughs> <You motherfucker. laughs> but uh some of the drawings she's made kind of look like the little symbols mm -hmm. that have been carved onto them so they go to interview her and talk to her, and during the session when she's explaining how it works, she actually goes into a trance and starts to draw and sketch out this, like, looks like a pillar almost. Yeah. And they're very confused, and they're trying to figure out what it is, and when Shiraishi sees it, it immediately catches for him, and he's like, I know exactly what this is. Did this scene remind anyone else of the Evil Dead when... When uh, Cheryl is forced to draw the face of the Necronomicon. That's what I kept thinking of during the scene. It does now. Yeah, yeah that's a good It does now. Good comparison. Okay. All right. It didn't at the time, um, but... Hmm. Yeah, but we get a little bit about Shiraishi now, and he kind of becomes more of a part of the story in that uh, he, he used to like to go hiking, and he went to this mountain where there's this thing called Kutoro Rock, which is the uh, nine-headed spine rock. And not a type of music. Right. And... From one angle, it kind of looks like what she's drawn, where it's sort of like two pillars that are holding up like a, a level rock above it, almost like a Stonehenge kind of yeah. thing. But that angle is from a very difficult spot to reach angle. Like, that's the only way to see it. The The way that normal people would see it when they're hiking doesn't look that way. Mm -hmm. But because they had seen a picture already. Right. Shiraishi hiked around to that side years ago. Right. And took a photo of himself there. And so that's when the... Um, female reporter as well they go investigate mm -hmm. this area and, and that's when we get that awesome theme music again because yeah. they, they set yeah. their hike up the mountain to that song and once they they get there they're like no no we have to go around the other side but when they get to the other side they see like this little alcove that has basically like primitive drawings or whatever yeah, like it's like petroglyphs that are the symbols that are carved both on it's uh ken's birthmark and then what he carved into Eno. Yes. right so they take extensive photos of it uh kind of like the perfect horror film setup they don't actually pick up the rock and take it they leave it there mm -hmm. but well, they also rock be hard to take with you. <laughs> but at the same time though he says there's something wrong with my ankle yeah while so he... he's there and he's like i pulled nine leeches in a row 
mm-hmm. off of my ankle. And it's like, well, that wasn't a fucking omen, dude. Like, you should get the fuck out of there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And his legs start bleeding again where the leeches were. Yep. So they've got this, this symbol now. They're trying to research that. Which leads to one of the funnier parts of the film, I think, because the they look they're looking for an expert that knows about this an mountain, expert. someone that's researched these petroglyphs that they can talk to. Who are you gonna call? And so she calls and like speaks to like an association. It's like, hey, is there anyone that studies this place? And they're like, yeah, there is, but it's a horror director. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually connect them up with Kiyoshi Kurosawa, yay, who everyone's gonna know and love for Pulse, aka Cairo, uh, Cure, Creepy. I knew, so I've said on this podcast many times that I'm really shit with Asian horror. I just mm-hmm. haven't seen a lot, but I even knew that guy was yeah, somebody. he's great. He's a great director. <laughs> I knew that he was somebody. Yeah, and it's great that it's just him in the film, so it's just hilarious. Like, they weave him in just as another part yeah, of Yeah, he, he feels like, well, yeah, this guy's an expert. Mm-hmm. Like, I believe him. I buy it. <laughs> and yeah, you basically just learn that it's kind of his hobby in his free time. He likes to go places and like research these little symbols and try to translate them. Which is probably true for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Um, but yeah, what he tells them is um, that uh, Kutoro Rock was dedicated to Hiroko, which was a Japanese god who had the form of a leech. So immediately that's weird because Shiraishi had the weird leech incident while he was there. Right. But the key thing is they talk about these two symbols and they ask him to finally like interpret them for him. And so he starts with Ken's and he's like, well, this eye looking part, that's the oracle. And that means like a, a message from God or something that's ordained by God. And then the little symbol connected to it is some sort of act like a killing. So it's like a command from some sort of divine source that's ordering you to kill. Mm-hmm. Which if we translate that to what happened, Ken goes there and kills a few people. The mirrored part of it is what he drew on Eno, which is, again is the eye. So he's like, again, that's a command, a divine order for something to happen. But the symbol connected to it is some sort of big event. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, it could be anything. It could be like a mass murder. It could be just some big crisis is going to happen that's been ordained by this divine order. Hmm. It's already setting up to be pretty ominous. And then in the meantime, uh, one day while he's out, they go through his bag Mm -hmm. uh, and find some stuff in his bag. Like they start to really question. Yep. Like, (laughs) uh, okay. It's, It's not adding up. Well, yeah, so it turns out there's a bank ledger in his bag that shows that he actually has a lot of money mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that he's not broke at all, that he has like almost 700,000 yen yep. or something sitting in the bank. And they're like, okay, what the fuck's going on yeah. here? This is really not starting to to add up at all. And then meanwhile, we've still got more footage from Inno's camera. <laughs> So we have the part where it's a very small part, but it's when he's going through a subway station on his way uh, to his job and he walks by a police box and he's just like, oh, look, there's a police box. And then out of nowhere, he just goes, they have no idea what I'm planning. Mm -hmm. And that part is really like, it makes you tense up and you're just like, yeah, the fuck is going on here? And this is all the cool thing is they kind of intersperse all these things like together. So it's Mm -hmm. almost like you're watching things happen. And that's what I would call the third chapter of this film is it's the development as you learn more about him and they're researching and doing all it's like a Call of Cthulhu campaign almost. They're doing Mm -hmm. all the uh, the library use Mm roles to dig up everything and figure it out. Sure. Mm -hmm. Doing all the footwork. Um, But the other notable thing from his days is that after work one time, uh, one of the other co-workers he has comes up and starts insulting him and says that he's doing bad at his job yeah. yeah and they have this little altercation and he sort of angrily starts to follow him with the camera and he says you know i'm i'm sensing in my mind that he's gonna die but i would never tell him that right and, and he like, i'm not gonna hurt him but i yeah. i have a feeling he's about to die a dude gets fucking hit by a truck. Yeah, he yeah. gets to an intersection. He tries to cross, and he just gets blam. And you see some over. sort of like spirit or something above him. It's almost it like a wiggling, like worm-looking spirit yeah. thing, jellyfish. And, and we'll see thing. that again. Hmm. And it makes me think of the leech connection as well, because that's also right. the same kind of design. And in the wake of that happening, he kind of just wanders off because there's an ambulance coming, and that's when he starts to notice like there's the weird symbols that are floating around. He sees like objects in the sky. Yeah. That's when, like, he hits the big time of, like, all the phenomenon happening right at once. Yeah, it's like some, some swirling void of dark clouds or something. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool looking. They're very, like, minimalistic, but I think they, they mesh in well where you believe that, like, it could have been there. Sure. It also looks like no one else is seeing these things. Mm-hmm. 
Which is interesting that it picks up on the camera. Mm-hmm. But we'll find out that camera <laughs> later. So the two separate paths kind of meet here with Eno showing them this footage. And of course, immediately they're kind of like, well, is the guy okay? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> I got the hell out of there. <laughs> but the important question is, am I okay? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so he he found a bunch of stuff. They resolved to pay him, and um, once he's paid, he immediately is like, "Hey, we need to go out. We need to celebrate. Yeah, let's this. go celebrate. He wants to go out." This time, though, you know, having to put up with him all this time, uh, the reporter she excuses herself. Yeah, she's like, "I have plans," and he's like, "You got a date?" <laughs> so rude. Yeah. Uh, the producer says he's already eaten, so he doesn't want to. And Shirai, she's like, eh, "Sure, I'll go out with you." Mm-hmm. He's still kind of pushing on this, like you know, he wants to find out the truth. So this second dinner, again, they go to the same uh, Korean barbecue place. Shiraishi gets him good and drunk, mm-hmm. gets him talking. And he, you know, he's like, come on, tell me really what the voice says and what you're supposed to do. And he kind of tells him, you know, we know you've been saving this money. We know you're not like super broke. What's, what's the deal? And so he tells him that what the voice has told him is that he has to take the money and build a bomb and do a suicide bombing in the like main busy street at Shibuya. Mm-hmm. And according to the voice, that when that happens, the explosion will take him and everyone with him into that other realm where God resides. And this is where I have issues, like moral issues, of why did... Was it just morbid curiosity that kept him almost like cheering him on? Well, here's the thing, is that when he first brings it up, they talk about it. He explains it all. And then Shiraishi goes, hey. I got to stop you. Yeah. I was lying to you. I'm going to have to stop you. Right. And then the guy's like, you can't do that. That's not right. You're yeah, not my we're fr- friends. We're yeah. friends. You're not supposed to do that. And he says, well, I am your friend and I care about you. And I don't want this to happen. So I'm not going to let it. And then he says, you're going to get punished. God's going to punish you for trying to stop me. And eventually they kind of, he gets like totally blitzed. And Shiraishi has to like reluctantly carry him out of there. Mm-hmm. And then that's where suddenly this strange phenomenon starts to happen again. Um, they see the weird, like, tentacled mass in the sky. Mm-hmm. Um, Ken shows up, dead. His eyes are, like, bloody. Yeah. He's standing there suddenly. He's standing there where Eno was. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly his head is, like, a weird, like, writhing mass of yeah. tentacles. Cthulhu type. And thing. then as he falls over, Shiraishi notices that the nine marks on his legs start to bleed again. Mm hmm. So do you think that Shiraishi basically stayed with him because, like, the superstition? I think this changed his mind. I think he I think he became a believer after this. Okay. I think partially he's thinking that at some point he'll find the spot to stop it, but... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't get that. That's one of the things that bothered me about Shiraishi. I like the way they play it because there is no clear answer to it. Yeah. yeah. But that bothered me about the character because it's like, okay, you knew that what was going to happen. Like... But then again, once we get to where, I mean, I think we're pretty much to the point where we can start talking about that at this point is when he decides it's time. Mm-hmm. Um, what we should say is that uh, this is what I would call the fourth and final part of the film. He becomes impl- uh, complicit in Eno's plot and tries to help him further it along. What I wanted to mention, this whole idea and this like final part, it made me think of some other films like uh, Man Bites Dog, right? Yeah, yeah. Classic. So there's plenty of other great films where they've had this idea where you've got like a very controversial subject, and the documentarian is kind of pushed over that line of objectivity between like just documenting what happens and then becoming complicit in what's going on. Right. And it also, what year was this film? Uh, 2009. Okay. So clearly the same things weren't set up in Japan where if you were to go to a hardware store and buy all of the things <laughs> that he bought that you wouldn't get flagged immediately. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of nails. Yeah. Which is pipes. All, that was also very disturbing that mm-hmm. he talked about like he's going to fill them with screws and nails and everything. that'll make it do more damage. Because it will do as much damage yeah, as possible. Those are some of the most haunting parts is just watching them go through the motions of It's like, very methodical. Yeah. Like everything is planned and it's almost like at this point for me, I really didn't like watching the movie anymore because it was, it gets real dark. Like it's surprising how fast it turns. It be, it felt like I was watching some sort of like, I don't know, like propaganda footage from sort of <laughs> some, from like a terrorist organization, you mm-hmm. know, like 
just because he's so methodical about what he's doing, but he's also so such a zealot as to what he's doing. And in any sane person's mind, at some point, something would go, this is very wrong. But in his mind, because he's so ingrained in this belief of what he has to do, like, it's just become, like, he mm-hmm. has become a religious zealot and must do it. And one thing I think is probably definitely, like, meant to be referenced here is uh, in 95, there was the very famous Om Shinrikyo sarin gas attack. Yes. Where they tried to uh, release sarin gas on a bunch of subways. And that was a cult. Mm-hmm. That and that was a cult that did that. Mm-hmm. And uh, Eno's thing is focused not on a train, but at Shibuya Station just outside. So it's very, it's got that same vibe to it. Right. And I think Americans will easily be able to connect to it as mm-hmm. well because of 9-11 and, oh, yeah. and everything and the terrorist attacks that we see daily mm-hmm. on the news. I think anybody can connect to this and start to see. Yeah, the marathon bombing, things like yep. that. Yeah, all of these are very, those were very, I didn't realize how much I was affected by some of those. Like, we hear about them so much in the news that we kind of shove them to the back of our brain like, great, mm-hmm. another bombing. But I don't think until I watched a movie like this where it puts you in the mind of the guy who does the bombing, right? how much those actually affect your psyche in general. And like they start to swirl back in and you're like, oh, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like it, they're, they're in there. <laughs> we just actively try to suppress them because yeah. they're so prevalent in our culture. But so, yeah, as he's... There's two interesting plot developments before they get to the big day. So... um there's a random part where they've bought a bunch of the gear and they're walking back home Yeah, and a dude in the street just like starts accosting them. It's like he <laughs> mystically just knows what they're doing and is like trying to stop them. It's the most like, it's, it's the only comedy you get kind of in this. It's the most the anticlimactic film, yeah. fight too. Like they just take turns stealing the bag back. Yeah. yeah he's got other. like, he's got something like in a big sock or something. He's, yeah, he's like with. slapping them with it. Like fruit. I don't know what it is. He's using it like a flail, and he's like hitting him. <laughs> and the best part is when it's all said and done, and they get away. He turns to Shiraishi, and he's like, "Man, people are just fucking loonies these days." <laughs> yeah, all right. They're not saying like us. <laughs> it kind of makes me wonder if there's a companion piece to this film that's following that guy yeah. and his scarring. Yeah, says, it makes you like, wonder if he also has like a divine uh, something happened. Is it like a mosquito? Right. Yes, <laughs> dude. It's gonna. <laughs> I'm being haunted for writing that review of Mosquito State. <laughs> <laughs> it's sitting on your hair. No, there it goes. It's okay. At least it's not a spider. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. And then one day they're prepping some of the pipe bombs that are going to go into his like bomber jacket. Yeah, th- I like this scene a lot. <laughs> They've got everything splayed out on the floor of the office, and then the reporter shows up, and she's going to check in. She wants her camera. She's working on another piece. And they're trying to clear up all the gear and get all the pipe bombs hidden mm-hmm. and everything put away before she comes in. And she's very suspicious of them because yeah. they've already been repulsed by Eno, but suddenly Shiraishi is like buddy buddy with them. Right. Uh, but they, you know, get her the camera, she leaves, and then they kind of just start laughing about how, like, oh, look, there's still gunpowder there on the floor. Yeah. The bombing switch was hanging right up there. She could have <laughs> saw it, but she didn't. I love that scene because y- you want them to get caught because you don't want them to actually go through with this, but yeah. at the same time, you don't want them to get caught. Right. And I love those scenes that make you side with the bad guy. Like, a classic example would be Psycho. Mm-hmm. When Norman's trying to get the car to sink into the swamp. <laughs> yeah. And it stops, and he's like, oh, shit. And then you're like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to get caught. Well, wait a minute. He should get caught. Yeah. There's moments here that and I've referenced this film quite a few times on the podcast, but there's moments that really reminded me a lot of Creep. I could see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Such a good movie. Where you're kind of, you've become so ingrained in this mm-hmm. horrible person's life that, that these horrible things are seeming normal. Right. And like when things would happen to, you know, <laughs> Peach Fuzz and Creep or whatever, you're like, <laughs> Oh shit, this is where he's going to get caught. Well, it also doesn't help that if you're like the protagonist in Creep, you think that maybe I'm the asshole and I just need to give this guy who's all freaky and weird and stalking me another chance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but not to derail it, but I kind of had moments of thinking yeah. like that. That's a good comparison. Of, of when, you know, especially in this part, but when they're, 
There is a really funny scene where he's trying to hide this giant cardboard box yeah. full of yeah. all of he this. He puts a sleeping bag over it. It's kind of like laying on it. Mm. And she walks in and she's like, what's under there? And he's like, I made a bed out of a cardboard box. Yeah. <laughs> like, and yeah. he just kind of like drapes across it. It's the most <laughs> bullshit answer. And she's like, whatever. But she knows. Mm. She knows at she this knows point something's up. that it's all, that something's up. And, you know, there's another incidental scene that's funny I like where um, they first get the bombing jacket together. And he's like, oh, could you help me try it on? It's kind of like uh, a wife helping her husband yeah, put on right. his suit in the morning. Yeah. But but also, it, it's very creepy, though, to mm. watch that scene. Because he puts it on. And he's like, how do I look? And Shrek, she's like, oh, you look cool. Yeah, like look a badass. hero or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah like it's, and it's like, oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I guess for me, I just really struggle with Shurishi in that. Like. I don't know. I, I you can't really like get into the mind of why somebody believes what they do or why they've just decided like this is sure. I mean, what makes people believe those things? Right, like with Inno here, you know, it, his experience made him believe this. It happens in real life. And like, it, and it seems that Shiraishi's supernatural experience is kind of what pushes him mm-hmm. over the line. Yeah, and I even wonder like, is his supernatural experience? Because he's immersed himself in this mm. world of someone else. Because from the start, too, he's the one that's wanted to find the paranormal right. that's there. It's like he's magical thinking. Mm. He's looking for the answer. Mm. And then as things start to, pieces start to fall into place that could make him believe the answer. And it probably didn't help that he was drunk, you know, when he <laughs> saw it. But like all of these yeah. things kind of pile together. And it's like, okay, well, I can get the answer that I need now. And that's what I was wanting the whole time. Mm. But, uh, so we get to the day. Yeah. The fated day. They go out. They have a nice meal. Was it Shiraishi convinces him to try Indian curry, I think? Yeah. You know? Such a weird scene. And because they're having Indian food, for some reason it makes Eno bring up Indiana Jones. <laughs> Indy. Indiana Jones. Yeah. Sure, I get it. And he's like, isn't it India? And he's like, no, I think it's the state of Indiana. <laughs> right. And then he's like, you know, there's a new film. He's like, what? There's a new film? Well, let's, let's go see it. Could you imagine the last day of your life, the final film that you see, <laughs> is Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? Oh, man. It's like those poor guys that were dying like when um, Phantom Menace was coming out and all they wanted to see <laughs> was Phantom no. Menace before they died. And then they see Phantom Menace and they're like, oh. Go ahead. I'm sure they just tricked themselves like I didn't. No, it really is a good movie. I, I just need to watch it again. <laughs> need to watch it 20 more times and see if anything gets better it's just so good i don't realize how good it is <laughs> but that's the best part is they go watch it and then afterwards he's like oh it was so good <laughs> uh, i don't know watch that movie kind of made me want to kill myself and it's one of those moments where shiraishi kind of tries to pump the brakes again where he's like well you know we could go watch the movie again we don't have to do it today yeah and and was like no it has to be today and he's like if i hadn't watched that movie maybe but because I saw that movie, I know I'm supposed to do it today. <laughs> I'm supposed to die because I've seen the Crystal Skull. <laughs> there's, there, um, that's the first thing that's made sense in this film in a while. <laughs> and then there's a neat, awkward scene where they're taking... It's when they first... It's before the film. It's when they take the taxi uh, to the area to like set up the jacket in one of the lockers for later. Right. And they're talking to the taxi driver, just like chit-chatting. And then he's like, oh, we're going like near Shibuya Station. And he's like, yeah... Uh, it would be really bad if there was like a terrorist bombing there or something. <laughs> and the driver's just like, yeah, that would be bad. Yeah, it would be. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that, like, that again, Shiraishi's like, hey, are we doing the right thing? And Inno's just like, yeah, of course. Of course mm-hmm. we are. This is what's supposed to happen. Right. So as they're there, and he gets himself all suited up, mm-hmm. he gets the vest out and everything. He hands, um, he tries to hand Shiraishi the camera. Well, Shir- uh, Shiraishi gives him the camera because that was one of the things they talked about. He wants to have the camera when he goes to the other world. So they can see what's on the other and side. And he says it'll be cooler. Mm-hmm. It'll be cooler if you send me the camera back Yep. from the other side. And they get up there. It's almost time. And he's like, oh, wait, I need to give you back the hundred yen coin mm-hmm. that you, you loaned me when we first met. Right. And Shiraishi says, no, no, no. You keep that too. Yeah. And if you can send me the footage, send me the coin. Send me the coin. Oh. And, and so literally he just walks off. Into a giant crowd of people. And Shiraishi starts rushing back <laughs> yeah. to try to get some cover. And the reporter shows up and she's like, hey, I've been following you all day. Yeah, what's going what's on? Going what are you on? up to? And he's trying to like get her around the corner to protect yeah. her. But she doesn't want to even be touched by him no. because she knows. She gets on the phone, so it's calling the cops. And thankfully, they don't 
I don't know. I don't want to say thankfully because it's what they did was disturbing enough. Mm-hmm. Like there's the explosion, there's a white flash, and we just see some little bits of what Shiraishi's camera catches, which is pretty much the reporter chick blown yeah. blown to pieces. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple sever I think there's a couple severed heads mm-hmm. yeah, her heads off laying around and or, yeah. it's not great makeup effects or anything like that, but it, it's shot in a way that it's like smoky mm-hmm. and creepy. Totally passable. And made me really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Like that's when I was having moments of like thinking of the stuff that I've seen in the news. It's like, oh fuck. Yeah. You know, and there's part of me I think that always thought it wasn't gonna happen in the film. Really? Mm-hmm. That like something would stop it. But no, <laughs> this movie's just that fucking dark. Yeah, like, so, it's not going to So the end result, it. they tell us in some, like, you know, on-screen text, yes. uh, 108 people died, 245 were wounded. Inno's body was never found, just like Ken. Right. There were no remains, seemingly. And, yeah, the uh, reporter, which I finally tracked down her name. I was having trouble finding it because the IMDb's, like, <laughs> incomplete. Yeah. It's uh, Shinobu, Shinobu. Kuribayashi. Uh, she dies, and Shiraishi... Gets arrested and sent to jail for complicity in the attack. For 21 years. Yep, 21 thought, years. 21 was pretty pansy They may have like, a limit. Like a lot of other countries have a limit. The maximum you can so- sentence anyone to. Interesting, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not 100% on that. It would be good to... But so that. when he's out, like it flashes forward mm-hmm. to now he's out. And it's the producer guy that picks him up, right? Yep. And they go... Back to that same Korean barbecue. Yeah, back to you know celebrate him being out or whatever, and they're kind of talking about everything, and all of a sudden, like shit falls from the ceiling. Yeah, just literally drops. And it when he looks down, it's the camera, mm-hmm. and then when he picks it up, underneath it is the hundred yen coin, and he tells him, um, he like picks it up, and the uh, the uh, producer's like, no, that's they don't circulate those anymore. Like that's an old coin. Mm-hmm. Like, those not in circulation anymore. So it kind of goes on to prove his thing while he looks for the footage mm-hmm. and opens up the camera. And, and what we see the final scene of the film is that footage. Yeah. We see, and then you get that. It starts with the POV shot of Eno. Yeah, yeah the camera on neck, himself. I was looking up at his face. So again, you see the bombing from his perspective where he just kind of walks out in the midst of the crowd, hits the switch, everything Flash. goes white. Yeah. And then we're given this just like crazy, I mean, it's Lovecraftian, right? It's like it a is. weird hellscape of colors it's and shapes. Like a, yeah. There's like these squid things flying around. And... Um, but but Inno's in that. Mm-hmm. like, And it, he's screaming. He says, this is hell. He's begging Shiraishi to save him somehow. Yeah. And it's like this weird, creepy, negative imagery. Like, and you'll notice some of the other decapitated heads are like, Ken is there, the people that Ken murdered are there. Yeah. And then uh, Eno actually gets like decapitated by one of these like leech looking things, yes. and it starts like consuming him. Yeah. And that's the last shot of the film. Yes. So there was another thing that kept getting brought up in the film that I wanted to do some research on, but I didn't get a chance to. They kept talking about mad cow disease. Mm-hmm. Like, and... That mad cow, like, they didn't order the beef or something Mm -hmm. for so long because so many people got sick from American beef import of mad cow. And I couldn't figure out why they kept bringing that up other than... Well, when was mad cow disease, like, a big thing? That's what I was wondering. Like, I I didn't have a chance to look it up. But it was just a weird thing to bring in. I think it was, like, what, 05 or something like that? And it made me kind of wonder, like, is... Are they blaming this on mad cow disease? <laughs> like, I was a little worried, though, like, at the end of the film, what the, I hate to use this term, I'm sorry, what, like, the agenda was mm-hmm. of what the director was g- willing to promote and not promote, and I was afraid that he was going to leave it ambiguous mm-hmm. as to whether or not he agreed with what he did or not, but thankfully he showed, the, like, the I'm in hell scene. Yeah. You know, to basically say, like, it was never what he thought it was. And it was essentially a trick by this, you know... Whatever entity. Whatever thing to do it. Which is one of the things I want to talk about is that this is actually a very Lovecraftian film. Probably more than a lot of films that, like, slap the Cthulhu name on themselves. Yeah. I don't agree with that. It has all the investigation and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. It has these hidden horrors lurking beyond... This, like, descent into, like, this terrible truth about the world. Mm Mm-hmm. 
I think if you had the character going a little more mad, mm-hmm. it would easily sell that as a Lovecraftian film. But it, well, I think Shirashi pretty much went mad. Yeah, which is why he started helping yeah. Mino and everything. Which that's like the fate of all Lovecraft protagonists: is yeah. either you go crazy and run away, or you become like part of the evil thing that's going on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about that ending. So, do you guys think it's more effective or less effective the way the ending is? Like, would it have? How would it have felt differently if it stopped at the bombing and we never saw the footage or that anything came back? Would that make the film feel differently to you? Do you think? Uh, my issue. Okay, I'm just gonna jump into this. Okay, I, I saw the ending coming mm-hmm. for a while, um, and I think the effects were so terrible it just completely ruined any effectiveness the ending would have had. Oh, the hell scene. Yeah, the hell scene at the end. Because it was. Just I will a say, lot I'm more bad CG and just really. I'm more forgiving weird. of it, but you have a very valid point. And that's often a thing when you talk about, like, a lot of people say for Lovecraft stories, they're unfilmable. Mm -hmm. Because the actual, like, big ideas, there's no level of effects work you can have that can ever adapt that in, like, a pleasing or meaningful way. Right. But why did they have to use the dodgy visual effects? I mean, they could have just put, like, burn makeup on them and have fire behind them and people running around and bleeding and stuff. And, oh, I'm in hell. That would have been far more effective than some PlayStation 2 cutscene. I honestly thought... The ending may was supposed to be funny. That that's how much it didn't work for me. Wow, it did take me out of the film, but I'm glad it did because I didn't like how I felt after the movie. See, I was wanted over. more of that. I wanted that feeling, that just dread, hopelessness, and then yeah, because mm. I figured that we that's are, what it was going to be. We are very different people. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I wanted more of that. Because my thought almost, and I think everyone would hate it if it was this, and I would be the only person that likes it, but if it ended right where the camera comes back and he gets the coin, and then that's it, and you never see I would have preferred that. Yeah. I would have preferred that. I think that would have probably been... Because uh... that at least clearly tells you there is something you know supernatural going on here. Right. And this we never get to see the full scope as viewers. From a storytelling standpoint, I think you you all have the better story. Mm-hmm. Like, from a storytelling standpoint, I think... What could have been dangerous, though, is it could land him on how do I, am I, am I like propagating this sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Like, am I okay with this? And I almost felt like it might have been his way of saying, like, oh, I don't want any part of it. Like, I told this story, but I don't agree right. with this sort of a thing. And it is bold of him to, like, cast himself in the film as himself, too. So I yeah. respect that. I appreciate That's that. That's a very, like, he's, I, he's put himself very close to the narrative, yeah. even though it is fictional. And I think it's okay to also portray horrible things. It doesn't mean you're endorsing them. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, some nutcase can latch onto it, but they're going to find something I think somewhere. He, I think he did such a good job, though, by making the characters so relatable. Yeah. That he put you in it so close to mm-hmm. the person that I think it would have been a fine line to walk. Because you, he never fully villainized. Like, he did some bad stuff. And, like, but he was never fully villainized. Like, you're still hanging out with him. Right. You know, the whole time. And you're still like, yeah, let's go watch Indiana Jones. Yeah, they're, you're, they're, even at the final moment, they're, like, yucking it up together. Yeah, you're never... It's never blatantly like, this guy's awful. Mm. It's left to you to know that this guy is awful. But if somebody were not in their right state of mind, they might think... Well, yeah, this guy is, you know, and the other thing that was really that I think hit me while watching it, too, is I'm reading and seeing so much shit on the news about these fucking QAnon assholes. Hmm. (laughs) Like, how many just showed up in fucking Dallas because they're (laughs) waiting on JFK Jr. to show up? Are we sure this is some sort of joke, like some weird performance art or something? Uh, But at the same time... (laughs) Are these people trolling us right now? I know. What the hell? Seriously. But at the same time, take one of those fucking weirdo assholes, Mm -hmm. stick them in this film, and it's believable. Mm -hmm. It's insanely... Well, that's why it's scary. I know. Because there are people like this. It's insanely believable that he's interchangeable with right. anyone that's a conspiracy theorist. And don't get me wrong. I I think that the the conspiracy theories that are not harmful are completely fine. The people who want to believe in like the 
the lizard people on the right. moon or whatever. I, that... I love conspiracy theories. I think they can be super fun, but there is a point where you go too far with it, and then right. it, it, qu- it stops being fun real quick. So I don't want to alienate any of anyone who might listen that might be into like paranormal and those type of conspiracy theories. Better not, because those are <laughs> <laughs> those are silly and they don't hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. But then you take like the QAnon fuckers that are. You mean the ones that stormed the fucking Capitol? Yeah, those people. <laughs> um, you take those people, and it's like, it's so fucked up that I'm watching a film from 2009 that in 2021 I can easily take somebody and just interchange them, mm-hmm. put them right in that role, and yeah. easily see them being somebody to say, no, God told me I need to go blow this up. I think he's a little ahead of his time on like calling some of this stuff. Yeah, I think he's not really reaching for anything that wasn't already being done by... Well, we've had suicide of, bombers of just like that propaganda for a long time. and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, he's really... I think it's. I think it was very bold of him to make the person likable. Like, I don't want to say he's likable for the whole film. Relatable. It's relatable. It's good because it complicates it for the viewer, I think. Yeah. 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 Likable's a bad It, uh, it bad challenges term. you, as we like to say. Right. Challenges <laughs> you. Um... So you wanted to talk a little bit, Michael, about why maybe this doesn't have a release. I think now that we have the full scope of the story and where it goes, we can probably get into that. I would I would think that it would be hard for a production company or an acquisition company or whatever mm-hmm. to want to grab this one, especially with the current political climate. And Do you think even when there's stuff like, you know, Serbian film has a Blu-ray release? Yeah, because I think that... Serbian film is almost that's almost funny. I want to say <laughs> and how extreme it I want to say that so Serbian, out there. Serbian film almost winks at the camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To like you cannot take that movie seriously. Exactly. Like it's almost winking at the camera like we know. Don't worry, we know. But a cult never does that mm. ever. And so I think that it could be while I think it was a well-made film I think it could be a dangerous film. Mm-hmm. I think it could be something that maybe that just a company doesn't want to associate with. Like, yeah, it's a good film, but I think that it could do more harm than good right now. So we're not going to put it out. Well, listen, when the Dustin archive starts, it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> volume number one. And I don't want to cross that line to, into censorship to say mm-hmm. that you shouldn't put this out there because of what some asshole might do. But I think it's probably more on the terms of like capitalism and business sense. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, just the fact that it's a foreign film alone. I mean, I, they, they haven't seen this. Even if they did see it, maybe the whole bombing thing would turn them off. But people aren't seeing people who care who can distribute these movies. They're not seeing it. They don't care. It right. Doesn't matter. Right. It's not worth their time because they don't think they're going to get any money from it. Well, and we talk about this all the time when the neckbeards and the comment threads start <laughs> throwing out like, well. You, you know, they're just putting out their mainstream movies and the other stuff doesn't get any love. And I'm like, it's fucking money, people. Yeah, like, it's all about money. Everything's about money. They're not going to spend a bunch of money on a disc that no one's right. going to buy. Oh, I'm sorry. This one guy, Anime Butt Lover 69, on a chat thread. <laughs> oh, he's back. He's yeah, back. Said, well, I'd buy three copies. Like, that's usually me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was Anime Butt Lover 69. I'd buy three of them. I, yeah, man, I'm just I'm just saying, Arrow, like, get all his found footage films, make a set, <laughs> we are golden. Surely it wouldn't... Uh, you don't even need to clean this one up, though. No, looks, Like, what I saw looked fine. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not supposed to look fantastic anyway. No, it know. sells, it goes with the, you know, the aesthetic or whatever, but... Which, you know. is, which is one of the joys of found footage, is that when you do it well, that lower fi right. kind of visuals really shine. Yeah. But that does make me wonder, though, like, if that could be a potential reason why this is not does not have a release mm-hmm. or we've not heard anything about anybody wanting to pick this up because even with such a prolific director you'd think somebody would grab up all of his stuff and release mm-hmm. a box set like that's kind of also what i thought uh, with shutter where they did two of his films i thought well maybe they're just going to license all his stuff for streaming but it kind of tapered off after the two there could be some weird rights issues and things like that too Who knows? That, that's a whole other thing yeah, too there's that's... no telling i do that that does lead me to say to a point though like i think in when it comes to horror and storytelling like we do have to be cognizant Mm -hmm. of climate you know there are times where i think what you're making can be a statement Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. on the climate of what's happening. But then there are things that like maybe you made and then the climate shifts a little too close <laughs> to that. And you're like, uh oh, <laughs> you know, I, d- I don't ever blame the filmmaker mm-hmm. for that or anything, but there's, I think it's just you need to make viewers aware of what the content is and then leave it to them to decide yeah. what they can handle. This one, honestly, I would have to I'd have to put a pretty heavy warning on this one for a lot of people. I think anybody who might have experienced any major trauma related to like a terrorist mm-hmm. event, this would be real hard to watch. Oh yeah. Real hard. So So should we get into our final thoughts? Let's do it. Yeah. Michael? I'm going to go for three. Three? I think three out of five. I want to go higher because I did enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I did find myself thinking about it a lot after watching it. It did have a pretty profound effect on me. But as far as like loving the film, I don't know if I can. It's a tough watch. It is a tough watch. So it's one you might not just readily be like, I'm going to throw on a cult. Never. (laughs) (laughs) This That will probably be the only time I'll watch this movie. (laughs) I'll think about it. I, uh, I've i watched it like three separate times in the lead up to us recording this episode. <laughs> Do we need to be worried? I don't know what that says about me. We are all such Do different people. Do you know, have any plans? You know, God has to chosen me to do a little task. I'm not saying it's killing people. But, no, right. Hmm. Sure. Okay. God chose me to collect all the Blu-rays. <laughs> <laughs> I will do it. By any means possible. Oh, God. So three. Three for me. Cool. Um, I'll go next. Okay. We'll save Jason for the end. Sure. <laughs> Uh, it's five stars all the way for me. I, I love this film. Really? I think it's amazing. I love everything that it does. The Lovecraftian elements. The amount of dread that this film can build. And even, like you said at the start, Michael, there's no like extreme gore. There's no crazy kills or like over-the-top moments. It's all very subtle and very slow. But it's like brick by brick, they build up to this huge idea that's very frightening and very hard to deal with and wrestle with. And it's a film that like sticks with you and... like. Even days after watching it the first time, I remember thinking about thinking about it, going back over it, wondering like, you know, was there ever a time that Shiraishi could have stopped it, or was this like some supernaturally faded thing, or did he lose his objectivity at some point? It's one of those things. It makes you want to think about it and wrestle with it and go go over it a lot. And I love films like that that make me really think and kind of make me consider like stuff I probably don't want to think about. It's almost like, could I give the film a score and then the filmmaker a score? (laughs) Because I would give five stars for the filmmaker because Mm -hmm. I think that genuinely that's an amazing job to take as little as you, as they took and make something that's so uneasy. That's an impressive feat. I really do think that that is something that shouldn't be overlooked. Absolutely. As to how... Because, Jesus, man, like, you give Michael Bay how much money to make a movie, and he literally, like, shits on a screen, and people are like, it's great. I mean, for Shiraishi, that would be, like, five or six films. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so five for me all the way. Jason. Uh, Two and a half. Was it the end scene that killed it? Honestly, okay, there's, I had a couple of issues with it. Well, let's get into it, yeah. We've mostly been, like, praising it, so it's good to have balance. Sure. Um, I love the beginning. It was a great feeling of dread. Oh yeah. But I think the movie quickly loses that. I, I, I know I say this a lot, but it's too long. The movie is too <laughs> long. It, it doesn't sustain that dread for me. It gets, it gets too, and it's kind of interesting in its way because mm-hmm. it's kind of almost like a slice of Japanese life in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Cause you're seeing like, I didn't know about manga cafes and right. You know. See, I love it. Cause I feel like you get lost in. Inno's life with everyone else. Right, and that's the cool aspect, but it to me it's just too much of that. I get bored. You know, that the feeling of dread I felt at the beginning just dissipates. And yeah, at the end of the week it just it was really under it was really almost funny. Mm-hmm. That, really, that is truly probably the weakest part of the film, is that final scene. Yeah. And for me it, just, it undercuts everything that happened mm-hmm. before. I just I can't get over it. Um well, I don't think anyone would hold that against you. Yeah, right. Uh, it's not a bad movie. I mean, two and a half is a fair rating. <laughs> <laughs> That's average. Two and a half out of For five you. is average. For you. No, it's it's exactly average. <laughs> two and a half out of five is average. Uh, Jason, would you say it was uneven? I would say it's uneven. <laughs> you should 
<laughs> if it were like 90 minutes, I also, I, I, I think you experiment. were just naturally bred to like oppose Japanese films. Cause most of them are like two hours plus a lot of them. Not, not all of them. <laughs> not the ones I like the most. <laughs> well, I'm over here like four hours. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. But horror is such a, it, it's difficult to sustain it for that long. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I don't think this movie does that. Are you talking about horror or your sex life? <laughs> both. <laughs> Very kinda, much. Kind of interchangeable. Uh, what was the thought you were going to get to? I'm sorry. I had a thought experiment in my head. I was wondering if this was an American film. It would be awful. Exactly. <laughs> would you like this movie so much if it wasn't Japanese? And they, I'm not, I'm not they like. They would change something about it, though, because you can look at the other ones like Pulse. But you can do shot for shot. Would it be as good? Hmm. Would you like it as much? I think the very Japaneseness of it, is that a word, makes it much more interesting. Well, you're right. There are so, like the manga cafe. That's a very cultural thing. We don't really have an equivalent. We have internet cafes, but it's totally not the right, same. Totally different. The temp worker situation in Japan is a lot different from how it is here. Mm-hmm. Like the the calling every morning kind of thing. Right. I just I think if this was an American made, low budget horror film that was almost two hours that had those effects, that ending, and everything. I don't think people would like it that much. I think it's also how we view Japanese people and culture in general. Like, that seems to me like a very un-Japanese act to do. Like, that act of terrorism. Mm -hmm. Because everything is so centered around respect and honor and, like, legacy. That it's, you know, it's... I think it would be different because if we were to watch an American person doing it, we'd be like, they're obviously fucking nuts. Mm-hmm. It, to, it's kind of interesting that you point that out because if I were to see this as a a white male in that role, mm-hmm. I would be like, he's just fucking insane. Right. Mm-hmm. But I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. With a, I'm like, well, it, it, the film puts you in that question of is it is he crazy or is it this like a divine ordained thing? But if he were a white guy, I would have probably been like, he's just fucking crazy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And maybe that's due to the exposure to everything that we see of crazy white people, crazy white men killing people. Mm. Florida man. Florida man. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. That's that's an interesting question. Mm. That is a good question. It's a thought I had. So I was disappointed, but I could also see why people will really dig the movie. That's on Jason's tombstone. (laughs) I was disappointed, but... (laughs) It was an even... (laughs) Oh, I'll chip in for that if that's what we're going to do. <laughs> I was disappointed, please do, but... Please. So we want to give a special thanks to Aaron for writing in and suggesting that we cover this film. Sorry, I kind of crapped on it, dude. Yeah, he's used to <laughs> We, lo- we used love you, buddy. That. Thanks for the suggestion. You, too, can suggest us a film to watch. You can write in, uh, email us at genreexposure at gmail.com. Contact us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just shoot us a message. Tell us the film. We'll add it to our list. We're kind of trying to pepper these in every few episodes. Reach out with your mind, and we'll do some automatic writing, and then write down your We'll try to channel the film that you want. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think if we we talked about this outside, and I think we have one more round, right? Yes, Before the end of the year. Three more episodes for the year. One more pick from each of us. Okay. We'll cap things off. And gotta, we're going next with Michael, I believe. Pick a good one. All right. I'm going with one that made an impression on me when I first saw it. Mm-hmm. I think Jason, you've seen it. Um, Dustin has not, but one of my favorite directors, Jeremy Saulnier. Saulnier. That's the Green Room guy, right? Green Room, yep. yeah. He did Love Green it. Room, Murder Party, Blue also Ruin. Blue Ruin, yeah. which is fucking wow, phenomenal. So He's a phenomenal director. Um, this one was very polarizing for him. Two, 20, uh, fuck. 2018's Hold the Dark. Yeah, I've um, wanted to see that for a while now. It's based on a book as well, um, but... Uh, has a a recurrence of one of our uh, regulars for the podcast, Riley Call. Oh, isn't it? Yes, we, uh, we love her at this point. Um, we can't say her name, but we love her. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm interested to see. Also interested to see how it holds up for me on a second viewing. Mm-hmm. And if people want to watch along at home before we get to the episode, this is on Netflix. Um, you do have to search for this. Mm. Uh, you'll have to go to the search bar. And you're going to have to actually type in hold the, because I, for some reason, Netflix is like, we don't want you to watch this because I checked before you even came to record this episode mm-hmm. and I actually had to type hold the before it even brought up hold the dark. So is it a Netflix original? Um, 
Well, they're going to say it is. Mm. They spent the money to <laughs> distribute it, so they're going to say it is all they want to. <laughs> um, yeah, so 2018, Hold the Dark. It's on Netflix. Jason, I'm sorry. It's five minutes over two hours. Um, uh, when, uh-oh. In the hands of a capable filmmaker, you barely feel it. <laughs> so I am excited to see what you guys think of this one, though. It's very, it is a very polarizing. People either cool. really liked it or fucking hated it. So we'll see how interesting how that goes. People are either wrong or they're right. <laughs> and it's okay to be wrong. <laughs> As always, guys, it's been so much fun talking movies and talking shit. Yes. I love it. Um, continue to reach out to us. We love interacting with you guys on all the socials. It makes us feel like what we do is actually not just screaming into the void and that somebody's actually listening. We always appreciate it. So until next time, thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you later. Bye, everyone. Take care. Take care.